we get stuck into our second episode, a quick bit about your host. My name's Meg and I'm a PR and communications officer at Liverpool University and I'm also an aspiring scientist. Last year I made the tough decision to return to university and pursue my love of biology. I found podcasts to be an incredibly helpful resource when making this decision, though I found them to be slightly field specific. From health sciences to social sciences, we're going to cover it all in this podcast series and show you how fast science really is. And hopefully you'll pick up a few tips and tricks along the way and help you on your journey to becoming a scientist. And joining us for today's episode is Professor Elizabeth Stoko, a conversation analyst in the University's School of Social Sciences and Humanities. Liz is an expert in conversation and has studied interactions in a variety of contexts, including healthcare settings, dating, commercial sales encounters, police interviews, and even hostage negotiations. She has a TEDx talk under her belt. She's appeared multiple times on BBC Radio 4, including on The Life Scientific, and most recently on children authors Michael Rosen's show. She's also the author of a book titled Talk, The Science of Conversation. Hi, Liz, welcome to the show. First of all, the important question, what mug have you gone for and why? I've brought my most recent one, uh, my newest one that my mum bought me, which is basically a mug that says, my dream home is a keeper's cottage in a bluebell wood because she knows that I love woods and bluebells. That's a lovely mug. It's very colourful, is it? Did you say it's hand painted? It's not hand painted, but um, it, it is very beautiful. Yeah. Very pretty. Yeah. Mine's kind of different style, so <laughs> a cute little octopus friend that I got from the Sea Life Centre. So very nice, very cute. And what are you drinking? Are you drinking tea today or coffee? I'm drinking tea. Um I over the years I've become a complete tea snob and now I'll only drink um like real tea, not tea bags. So I'm actually drinking an, an Assam, a, a swanky, fancy Assam tea. Lovely. And um have you also brought an artifact with you today to show us? I have bought an artifact, yes. It's um, a t-shirt. Uh, it's a t-shirt from Latitude Festival that people might know, um, a sort of music and, and, and literature and so on, comedy festival. And I was fortunate enough to be asked to appear there in 2016. And so on the back, you won't be able to see this, but not quite at the bottom, but somewhere on there, alongside obviously the more sort of, you know, starry names um, is my name on a, on a festival t-shirt. That's, that's very cool. So how was that talking at a festival? It was fantastic. Um, I was in, you know, it, it was the Wellcome Trust and British Psychological Society who organised the the tent. They had a stage, um, and so obviously there were multiple sort of science acts, um, and it was fantastic. Yeah, it was great weather, fortunately, and a really interesting and varied audience. And the whole experience was really wonderful. I feel very lucky to have done it. And who headlined that year? Uh, well, New Order, which I have no idea if the audience will remember, there's certainly my era from, from sixth form in school, um, and a whole bunch of other people that some of them I've heard of them, some of them, some of them not. Um, the National Churches, the Maccabees, um, uh, and, and actually, yeah, a whole bunch of other, you know, probably. That's very famous. cool, Shane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Deal with those. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's get stuck into it. Um, so, your conversation analysis. Um, can you explain what that entails, please, and what you, you, you do? I study people talking. <laughs> I study this. So I, I, but I study it in a particular kind of way. So I collect recordings, or more typically, I'm, I'm given recordings from organisations that are already making them as part of the, the organisational remit or purpose. Um, so sometimes it might be a single case, sometimes tens, sometimes hundreds or even thousands of recordings of encounters, um, which might be patients calling their doctors or people on a date or a police interview with a suspect, all of those kinds of um, recorded encounters. And the really crucial thing about it is that conversation analysis uh, examines real talk in the wild as it happens. Um, and I'm a psychologist by background, and it's very interesting that psychology as the science of human behaviour quite often doesn't look at behaviour in the wild as it happens. It's more typical to simulate it or get people to role play it or experimentally produce it or ask people about it later. Conversation analysis is US, USP, if you like, is real talk as it happens in the wild. What's the importance of studying conversation and talk is it is it not just something that we do um and i'd also like to ask as well have we have we learned all there is to know about the way that we talk already or is it an ongoing kind of area of study um it it's really important to study 
conversation, talk, social interaction, and we certainly don't know everything there is to know. Um, I, don't, I don't suppose any scientist would ever say that we know all there is to know anyway. Um, but you've hit on a key challenge for conversation analysis um, and communication experts more generally, I think, which is we all do it. Um, so unlike maybe being a physicist and studying something like black holes, black holes don't exist in the first place to be understood by humans. So, so the sort of challenge of a of, of somebody explaining what they do um, that you're not immediately hit with the well, why do you, you know, we already know about that stuff. Um, whereas when you study people talking, most people talk already and, and, and they're people are quite keen to assert what they think they know about communication. There's lots of anecdata out there. Um, but but what you find um, when you study talk and conversation scientifically is that it works in a systematic way with a machinery that is universal. Um, and one of the things that I find myself doing quite often is myth busting. Um, so, for example, people will tell you things like, isn't communication 93% or 90% or some, some high percentage that they've picked up somewhere? Isn't it all body language? Isn't nonverbal, you know, what, mostly what, we're, what we are communicating with? Um, but of course, you, you only have to sort of turn your brain one, one rotation to think, well, that can't be true, because otherwise you'd never be able to call upstairs to someone and, 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 and talk to them, or, or you wouldn't be able to talk on the phone, um, you wouldn't be able to talk in the dark. Um, so, 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 of course, and, and you wouldn't need a foreign language. So, of course, that, that particular myth is very compelling. And the communication world is full of very compelling myths like that, and at least one consequence of studying conversation scientifically is that you tend to do a bit of myth busting along the way. So talking of myth busting, I think obviously I'm reading your book at the moment. Um, what I found interesting was what I class as meaningless chat to be of importance. So in particular, the hello, how are you? That kind of thing. Yeah. Why is what I do to be meaningless chat? Why is that interesting to you and conversational analysis as a whole? Yeah, um, it, that's a great question as well, um, because because of something like the how are you's that typically starts at the uh, it's typically happen at the start of an encounter and and people tend to treat it as as pointless filler or that we kind of know that when you do those, how are you fine? How are you fine at the start of an encounter? Um, that isn't the place to get into, you know, the, the a deep existential kind of answer. Um, it, it's meant to be um, something that just kicks off something else um, that you're going to talk about but actually when you uh, and be, but, be, but be, because we know that because we know how are you fine how are you fine is that kind of rapid reciprocal thing that happens at the start of an encounter when it isn't there that is data and information so for example um if we hadn't done those how are you's and and you'd started the encounter by saying liz and then i might have said meg <laughs> <laughs> then immediately we know probably you know because of, and you can see this in, other, in in some of the examples that i've studied that they're going to have an enormous argument <laughs> and you can see it because of because of what's sort of missing the, the apparently meaningless stuff when it isn't there you can see that it's doing something so another another nice example is let's say you phone home um to someone who's at home because you think mm, i think i might have left the oven on and so you don't do the how are you's then either you basically say oh i'm just phoning to say can you can you check that I didn't leave the oven on? And you dispense with the apparently meaningless stuff. And that tells us that the, the, the how are you apparently meaningless stuff is in fact data. It's calibrating and telling us what kind of encounter we can expect to have next. It's definitely made me more conscious of the phone calls and conversations I have when people don't ask me how I am. I'm now, yeah. where, where is this going? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely opened my eyes to how important these things are. Um, so we've kind of touched on it in the introduction that you look at a range of different settings that we have conversations in. What are your favourite type of conversations to study? It, that's quite tricky because I have studied a wide range of, of encounters and I suppose um, some of the funniest ones would be people on first dates. Um, I mean they, they were some of them really quite painful but also hilarious and I, I I stopped doing that project after a short while because I didn't really want to become the person who studies first dates and gets, gets asked about that all the time um, but the thing I probably studied least is is just completely ordinary domestic interaction so the kinds of things that happen you know in my own house you know the calling up and down the stairs and and the conversations with uh, my husband and, and so on um, although I've probably made plenty of field notes <laughs> 
And I know you just said you don't want to be the person that's asked about first dates, but have you got any funny tales from that where it's just completely taken you off guard what's been said? <laughs> Yeah, uh, um, one of the things that I, I wrote about was how people establish each other's relationship histories and this being a bit of a key um, project of the people on the date. So the people that I was studying were 30 to 45, that was the age group, and um, they all seemed to want to know or, or would just reveal anyway what their relationship history was. Um, and they did, did, would do it in a tacit way, so they'd say something like, yeah, so, you know, my ex husband blah 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 which which tacitly reveals that you were previously married or or something about children which tacitly reveals that at least you've probably been with someone who was the you know the, the other parent um and so what i was what i was interested in was when those things were not tacitly revealed how did people approach the well you know what what's your history and and they wouldn't most the most the most the smoothest kinds of dates where it didn't go crashingly wrong people would say something like and um have you been married then or and they did it in that a connect you know not that interested in your answer no real kind of stake in what you say with a bit of a trail off at the end um and they designed it that way but there was this one date where the woman sort of out of nowhere said to the the man so what what's your history then your relationship history and it was such a a, a, a turning point in the date from reasonable to terrible because she didn't do it remotely subtly it was just out of nowhere and he and he said something like what have I had them yes I have and then he said oh well I'm sure you have <laughs> and then it just got really painful more and more as they went on it was yeah I was sort of think, listening listening to it sort of laughing and thinking run <laughs> subtle questions all the way forwards so then if anybody's listening yeah. reading dating yeah. advice <laughs> <Absolutely>, yeah <laughs> um so you've kind of touched on it earlier um so you get handed recordings from yeah. an organization or whoever they may be um but could you kind of talk us a bit more through the process for how it works so roughly how many recordings do you get how long does it take to analyze what do you do once you've got those and yeah. kind of when do you get to a conclusion yeah um i've been quite lucky over my career um sort of back yeah so by accident I, i've um managed to become somebody that organizations approach and want to work collaboratively on a project about some aspect of communication in the organization um, and it didn't start out that way you know it, I, I, I when I was first doing my PhD and then later I had to work really hard to try and get access to organizations so that I could get them to record so that I could study things and you know you can imagine all the reasons why people are sometimes reluctant to do that um, but I had a sort of turning point where I, I had done some research looking at um, mediation services and how they were able to convert people who called in with an initial inquiry about the service into the clients of the service and obviously that's really important because if those services aren't able to convince or persuade uh, people who are in dispute that mediation might be the answer then they don't have a client and they don't have a service and because I've done that that work um, spending a lot of time navigating access to the services by the time I'd finished the project and had some quite interesting strategies and things to say to the services like if you explain mediation this way you're going to be more likely to engage your caller and they are more likely to be, become your client than if you explain it in this other way um, it, it word of mouth kind of took over and because mediation is a really interesting um, kind of discipline where quite a lot of mediators are connected into all sorts of other jobs, therapeutic jobs, counselling, legal services, police actually, negotiation. I just ended up being able to reach um, lots of different organisations when I went back and did my sort of very naive at the start, here's some things I found that you might find useful and then sort of gradually with experience was able to make that a bit more formal with, with training that people really wanted. So that meant that people, organisations would then come to me and say, we've got a problem and we together decide, OK, how many encounters would be enough for me to study? Um, what What's your interest in in what you want me to focus on? Mostly organisations are quite open to just trusting that, that me and whoever it is that I'm working with on the project is going to find things that are useful to the organisation. Um, so a nice example that we might come on to later is um, the crisis negotiation, suicide crisis negotiation with, with the police, um, whereby we didn't have hundreds of calls. So compared to a project I did looking at patients calling their GP, where we had literally thousands of calls. Um, 
that's you need to have a sense of how many of them are there in the world anyway so you know a lot of people call the doctors well whereas when it comes to crisis negotiation we had a relatively small total number of instances but they're very long encounters and they don't happen that much anyway mm -hmm. by comparison so it's sometimes the how many question is 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 more it's more about um well there aren't that many of them so you know if there's a really important 999 call let's say um let's say that I keel over on this this call now and you phone 999 and and then something goes wrong in that call and something dramatic happens then we're all going to be really interested to know what happened in in that one encounter mm -hmm. so I tend to you know it, it varies depending on how many of them there are in already um how many I think it will take to, un to understand the shape of those encounters and then in terms of the outcome um I think the crisis negotiation is a good example again of where by unlike the mediation inquiries where there's a sort of fairly straightforward outcome people either agree or don't agree to mediation at the end of the call in the crisis negotiations almost all of them have a successful outcome in as much as people stay alive so our our kind of decision about whether or not the project was finished and whether we'd kind of found what was effective wasn't based on whether or not um the person stayed alive or not because they nearly always do stay alive mm -hmm. it was more about how can the negotiation be as robust as possible all the way along sort of optimizing each moment of it and then understanding what you know we, when we found like 10 things that are really effective then that's probably we, we sort of draw a line on under that project and move on to the next one what i found interesting when i was reading your book is i didn't realize how comprehensive the kind of key or index um, of annotations that you use yeah um so uh, you know the inhale exhale could you explain a bit more um to the listeners who probably aren't familiar with what you're looking for um and how minute it is in conversations yeah so um one of the, the first step of analysis actually is to transcribe the recording and the transcription isn't just a verbatim transcript as you say it 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 it's so it's it was developed by um a woman called gail jefferson and conversation analysts use it it's a standard system and of course the good thing about a standard system is we all learn how to use it and then we can all look at each other's transcripts and know what what it what the symbols mean so for example we time gaps and pauses within and between turns the start and end of when people talk at the same time and all all of the things that um that that are also carried along with our words so the difference between an oh and oh you know so you can you can hear that they're doing different things and so we want to be able to represent them i mean the data are the recordings the transcription is the kind of aid memoir to what happened in the interaction but but the really important thing about it is that two things that i think are really important one of them is i think it's a really ethical practice because if you transcribe what people say ver verbatim then you're in fact not really transcribing what they said because what what people say isn't just the words it is how they say them as well which is really important and you only really have to look at look on twitter for you know kind of transcripts of what a politician said i quite often um will go back and and retranscribe you know let's say you know an, a currently notorious politician and see what act how it was actually said and 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 you get even more from that because that is what they did it is they didn't do the tidied up version they did the sort of messier uh version so I think it's ethical to do it, to not tidy people up, if you like, and, and represent it accurately. The other thing is that it, I, I think it, you, a good comparison is the musical notation system. So if we play a piece of music, the skill involved in the transcription is it, it being able to turn that piece of music into musical notation. And you need to be able to get the key right. Is it a minim or a crotchet? What, what is the pace? So it, it's, that, it's that kind of technical system where there is an accurate way to use the system but then once you can use it it's standardized and that means anyone can play the piece of music and it means that anyone can understand how the interaction happened that's a really good comparison between the, the music system that i think a lot of people will understand um when you just talk about the, the role of the general when you tell people you're a conversation analysis um do you find there are any misconceptions or they have they don't really understand what it is um what kind of question yes. <laughs> probably many especially um combined with being a psychologist which i am by by background um and there 
the reactions are sometimes just an immediately very stilted interaction <laughs> or you know the, the do you are you analyzing me now sort of slight fear um so yeah i think you know um people have ideas about what it might be to study conversation sometimes it's a rather sniffy we all do it so what you know what why why are you making a good career out of this all the way through to you know I sometimes do get emails from people tell, describing an encounter that they had and asking me for help in, in how to have a better interaction. Um, yeah, some, sometimes I might reply in a, in a short way and sometimes I'm a bit anxious about who it is that might be writing, so I might ignore it. But yeah, people have, in the same way that people respond to psychology, they have a sense of what you might be able to tell them about themselves. I get that. As, a, as somebody that writes for a living, I often get, but anybody can write. I can do it. So I imagine it's a similar thing there, but we all talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you always want to be a conversation analysis when you were younger? Did you have another career path in mind? <laughs> I definitely didn't want to be a conversation analyst because I'd never heard of it until until I became a PhD student. Um, so I, I was sort of thinking about this um, ahead of preparing for the for our conversation now and thinking, what did I want to do? Um, I, I, I probably wanted to work in a bookshop um, and I did work in some bookshops, um, you know, as, as a sixth former and and, and so on. Um, or be a publisher, because basically I was I've always been quite bookish um, and I spent some of my um, holidays during university uh, vacations working in a, in a little bookshop in a little tiny Welsh village on the borders called Hay on Wye which you might have heard of um, it's a t the town of books um, so I visited there with my mum and um, just wrote to all of them and said I'd really like a summer job and so I spent a lot of time uh, working in bookshops and thinking well do I you know what do I want to do and I, tr I got an internship at a publisher um, so I did a bit of that and then for a while um, because for A levels I'd chosen maths, physics, and chemistry, um, I probably was, was sort of trying to balance. You know what? What do I want to do? And I don't know. It's it, it, it's it's funny thinking backwards and wondering um, what what it was, how, how you came to these decisions. But I certainly know, know, knew that I was probably going to fail physics A level, so I needed another subject to get to university. So I picked psychology and did it at night class alongside sixth form, and I just found it immediately you know, it's very compelling and, and kind of um, something that I could do fairly easily. Um, and so that that then, because I became really interested in that, I sort of ditched the, um, the, the hard science side of things and thought, I'm, I'm going to do psychology. And I think really at the time, so this was in the, I, I went to university in, the, in 1990, um, around about that time at least were all the it was the start of forensic psychology on the television it was the start of the cracker generation and I thought I'm going to be a forensic psychologist <laughs> like like many students that still think now but you know I think I think that was there was a bit of a turning point in the 90s um, and actually after I did my degree I had a place to go and do um, forensic psychology masters um, but there was no funding for it so and I needed to have some kind of funded position, obviously. Um, so I was just applying for anything that had psychology postgrad, um, and somehow um, ended up on uh, a PhD program um, with a supervisor who was interested in social interaction in classrooms. So I saw it was a complete accident, really. But I immediately just really discovered that okay, this is what I want to do. Um, so it was a bit late in 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 some ways. Um, but it, and it wasn't a linear path by any stretch, but um, that's how it happened. I think that's a great example uh, for people listening that you don't have to know exactly what you want to do at A level because I think yeah. it's something that you feel very pressured to make a decision about. Yeah. Um, so can I ask, where did you go to university? Where did you do your PhD at? And then how did we get into doing? Well, how did we get to Loughborough? Yeah. Um, so I did my degree at what was then. Preston Polytechnic it was uh, it, in 1992 was the turning point where lots of polytechnics became the post 92 universities and I do remember at the time um, the students I think we all there must have been a vote or something I, I'm not sure that we won but there was all sorts of options for what Preston Poly might become called and I do remember thinking it was quite funny if we became the University of the M6 because I used to spend a lot of time in traffic jam <laughs> down the M6 anyway it became University of Central Lancashire um, and um, and then I did my PhD at what was then NEN College and became 
University of Northampton. But but interestingly, um, the reason why I got that studentship was because that the, the, the then then college was was not in the post 92 sector it was you know becoming a university it was and one of the things that it had to show to become a university was that it would graduate 50 phds i think so basically they had funding on offer to do a phd um and, and actually what happened was that um the we ha my, my my phd was actually from leicester because leicester was the kind of accrediting body for my phd even though i was doing the work at nen um and my my phd supervisor um who'd come to nen right at the end of her career um after working um at cambridge and then at uea um, and, the, and the open university she came to nen to set up a program in behavioral site in behavioral science actually um and and i was her one and only phd student and i had an external supervisor because of the whole setup and because nen hadn't accredited couldn't give couldn't award phds i had another supervisor um who was derek edwards and he was at loughborough and and they just they knew each other via in that sort of academic circles kind of way so um when i finished my phd i initially got a job at the university of derby and then because I was actually at this point married to somebody who lived in Hale Y, one of the bookshops, um, I used to commute from Hale Y to Derby, which wasn't ideal, uh, mm. although I made a lot of good friends at Derby. And then I moved to the University of what was then University College Worcester became Worcester because it was nearer to home. Um, and I stayed there for a couple of years, commuting sort of backwards and forwards still. And then the place that I really wanted to come to was Loughborough because Loughborough was the the world leading place to do um, the kind of interactional work in psychology um, and you know that that stuff was sort of invented at Loughborough um, so I was so lucky to come in 2002 it was for me that was that was my goal um, my goal dream job so I've stayed at, I've been here ever since. Have you got any kind of interesting stories from along the way so any kind of quirky field work that you did or anything at university that was quite unusual I, you know I, I i i think when you ask me that question the thing that immediately springs to mind is maybe one of the most interesting places that i was invited to go and speak um which was tatler um magazines some kind of event that they were doing i'm not i'm not to be honest even to this day i'm not quite sure what the event was but um <laughs> i was invited to tatler i went and met the editor in vogue house in london um and went and did a talk there and it was a, and I what I remember quite clearly was was turning up to do the talk and I had a sort of suitcase with me because I'd been staying with my cousin in London overnight and um the person that welcomed me in said you know we're shepherding me around and this is where we're going to present and blah 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 and if and, and she sort of took a quick look at my footwear and said and assumed that I was going to get changed to do the talk including my footwear <laughs> because I had this suitcase and um and and I said, oh no, this I'm I'm just going to wear these. And I basically had on my uh, I think New Balance trainers because I almost always wear trainers of some kind. And uh, she was like, oh no, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> and I and I just remember this sort of this hilarious moment of that I hadn't really thought about very much, which was you know going to talk at a rather fashionable magazine event, looking probably like everyone's stereotypical image of an academic actually <laughs> you know whatever the female version of that is you know but you know we, we know we know the male version is kind of slightly um you know patchwork jacket and wild hair and you know maybe i was a bit like that <laughs> but i do remember thinking oh i probably maybe i should have smartened up for this a bit <laughs> maybe they thought it was a fashion statement within itself <laughs> yeah. going against the um what kind of other locations has your work taken you to um, I mean, m most places really. Um, I've I've done um, both visits to universities um, in in lots of countries, um, and I've you, you might remember that earlier I was talking about um, working with mediation services, mm -hmm. um, and 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 this 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 kind of key thing that I did again by mistake really um, but it just turned out to be really useful to organizations which was to see how best to actually engage people in the mediation process to get them to become a client um, so I've actually done a lot of that work in the states as well because um, American mediation services 
have the same kinds of challenges um, that they have anywhere else. And so I've worked several times with the New York Peace Institute um, and other other organizations in the US. Um, I've also been to Microsoft in in Seattle. I've been to Google twice um, in Palo Alto. You know, I've, I've, I've done lots of things like that. I've been so lucky. I, I, I again, you know, my, my sort of younger self would be definitely thinking, wow, I, you know, I never saw any of that coming. And like everyone, I have that imposter syndrome thing of like, <laughs> really, am I am I am I doing this stuff? Um, you, yeah, I think I think that's good though. It's good to good to keep an eye on um, thinking of, thinking of, thinking about how to make sure you're not uh, being exclusive and helping lots of other people spread their own wings if they want to as well. I think just touching on what you said about imposter syndrome, I find that really interesting because to me, you're kind of top of your game. You're so well respected. You've got a book. You've spoken at so many different places. How, how do you handle and what tips have you got for handling imposter syndrome? Because I, I know it's something I suffer with and quite a lot of people I know. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I just find that interesting. It's something you still you still deal with. Yeah, I think I think. Um... This is just completely off the cuff, really, but I think I would sort of I, I would I would try to re, re, rephrase it, actually, and think that when you call it if, 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 if you're suffering from a syndrome and that that's obviously problematic. But I think if as soon as you think about it as having a bit of a, a healthy dose of humility, then mm -hmm. that's a good thing. I, I think, obviously, if if you feel if you lack confidence and it stops you taking opportunities when you really are completely qualified to 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 take them up, then obviously that's an issue. And I, you know, I, I do see that um all the all the time but but um i don't know i i sort of feel like i you know i i think i i gravitate towards people who've got a healthy dose of being humble and 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 not not full of themselves if you like um and i know that that they're not that isn't the same as as imposter syndrome and it's problem and it's problems but um on the whole i think it's just good to keep a level head about what it is that you what you're doing and and then just help other people to um mm -hmm take up opportunities if that kind of thing is stopping them doing it yeah mm -hmm. um so you've just you kind of mentioned microsoft google you've worked with a range of organizations yeah. could you kind of tell us about some of the work you've done and with these organizations but also you know any other kind of big names that you've worked with that people would be aware of yes um I mean, what, one of the projects, it's, it's sort of drawing to a, a, a well, not, nothing's ever really closed, but, but um, the work that I've done with my colleague Ryan Sickverland um, on crisis negotiation um, has been with them, and that, that was started um, by the Metropolitan Police um, who, who wanted this project on how, how do the police negotiators best engage people who are, you know, at, at, at at a horrendous moment in their life really sort of basically they're threatening to end their life and the and, and the police negotiator is also in this intense situation where they have they have to go there and and talk to the person um so i think that that work's been um it, it was quite scary to do it because of course what you don't want to do then is to be a really weak analyst and, and not be able to find and identify things that are effective especially if you're going to take those research findings and turn them back into training which is what we always do um, so that felt pressured in a we must get this right mm -hmm. um, but of course really our job is to figure out what people who are expert in their job what is it that they're doing um, that they can't tell you about because you know we're not really able to say what it was that we did three hours and three minutes into a conversation that, that was a turning point um, we, we, we're not very good as, as humans at sort of re-articulating later in a completely you know precise way what it was that we did that was effective so so one of the really really important things that we found in that analysis which i think is ca is counterintuitive it's not what was in the training originally but we could see that it was working was that if police negotiators asked people in crisis to talk to them which was you know a, a really standard kind of way to open the encounter it would get immediate resistance whereas when they formulated their request for dialogue with the verb speak can we speak um, then it didn't get resistance and so the difference that a verb makes it was quite massive but mm. it's the kind of thing that you would only find out if you bothered to look at what was actually happening in the wild in the actual encounter because 
you know, we know that um, if you don't study conversation, then you don't really have a sense that words like words, for example, are going to make a difference and you don't really believe it. So you sort of think, well, they are the right, the person's going to jump or they're not. It's all based on their, their mental health history, whether they are, you know, all sorts of factors and variables that might be something that psychologists would focus on um, that are going to make a difference. And, and the thing is, all of those might be true, but if you don't bother to look at the encounter itself, you're never going to find out what is inside that encounter that might be making a difference. So I think that's been really important kinds of work. Um, at, a, at a completely different level, I was lucky enough um, in 2018 to 19 to actually go and work in industry for a year. So I went and worked at um, a company called Typeform, which you might have heard of. Certainly you might have used one of their, they're a bit like SurveyMonkey, um, but their USP is they deliver conversational forms that people fill in. Um, so I went and, and lived in Barcelona um, and worked to worked with you know a, a huge range of um, people who put together all, their product basically so that involves um, data scientists and um, designers and um, UX designers and marketing and you know and and, and all sorts of experts that, that that work to make that a product um, and and my contribution there was to basically get people to really understand what their conversational USP would really mean in terms of structuring those forms and using the best types of questions in the right kind of order and, and that kind of thing. So that was quite an amazing experience as well. I think that really shows how varied your, <laughs> your role can be. Yeah. Um, just going back a bit, you, you mentioned about how crucial that one change of word is. Are there any other examples that you can identify where one word or a couple of words has made a huge difference? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, sh I should probably say, um, and we don't have time to, to talk about it now, but I, I would really encourage anyone who's interested to get in touch and I can send them the, the, the proper scientific papers that, that talk about this and show these findings. Um, so, of course, you know, words are all, always embedded in, in, in more words in a turn in conversation. So those things mattered as well. Um, but yeah, um, so one of the things that I found out really early on when I was looking at what works to get people to say yes to mediation when they're resisting it, is if you ask someone if they're interested in mediating, they may or may not say yes. But if you ask them if they're willing to mediate, they always say yes. Um, and so, um, th you know, th this is one of those things that if I kind of follows you around a bit, this, this willing thing, um, and people will often write to me, um, you know, would I be willing to help them out with this or that with a bit of a wink because they know that, you know, no one's meant to be able to resist um, requests when they're phrased with willing. So, but, but yeah, what was interesting about that was uh, uh, one, one of the problems, of course, with finding differences like speak, talk or, or willing is that um, the risk is that they become a stereotype and people don't really think about or they don't read the, the, the science that is behind all of that. And so it loses its nuance in translation. Um, at the same time as you know making popular the field that can find this stuff out so that that's a bit difficult but but yeah um, um, when you ask somebody who is resisting something like a dispute resolution process on the basis that they are lovely and the person that they're talking to is horrible if you ask them if they're willing to do it it's quite hard for them to say I'm not willing um, because they that just undermines their own sort of their bigger project which is say I'm a nice person um, mm. So if you say you're not willing to participate in a in a dispute resolution process, then that undermines the idea that you're you're the you're the nice one. Um, so that's probably why it works. That's fascinating, and um, I know it's kind of something you touch on in your book in terms of like tips for communicating better. Um, so just, let's talk about the book. Yeah. Why? How did that come about? Why did you decide to write a non-academic piece of work? Um, Again, I was really lucky um, after I, I did a, um, a TEDx talk um, and just again by accident, really, I did that talk. Um, I, I, I thought it was um, a sort of spam invite when I first got the invite to go and do that. It was in Bermuda. It was amazing. Um, and I was on, you know, 12 of us did a talk and, and just just for whatever reason, the main TED organization put my my video on their main website over Christmas after yeah, Christmas after I'd done it so it, it just went bananas on online um, which has 
definite downsides as well as upsides but but one of the upsides was that you know a lot of people just suddenly became aware of, of this field and it led to the, all the other reputations really that I, all the other places I've been have, have partly been down to that particular talk um, and so I, I actually was really lucky to just be approached by publishers um, several of them actually who said do you want to write a book <laughs> and um, and I, in, I in, in the end made my decision to go with the publisher that I chose um, partly on the basis that the editor um, that I worked with had had previously been an academic publisher of psychology so it, you know he, he kind of knew a little bit about my background anyway or the, or the field that I was working in um, so yeah I, I was just really lucky that I was asked to do it and I thought I'll, I've got a lot of material I've got all these talks I can probably turn them into a book so that's what I did. So how did you find the process of writing a book you know when you're used to writing academic papers and how long did it take and what was the reception like once you released it? Um, it's really hard to be objective about um, your writing I think um, and your talking you know speaking and all the rest of it. Um, I, I, there was a point where I was a bit worried that I was probably not able to write for either audience properly so I wasn't able to step outside of the academic stuff enough to write a popular science book and then that that somehow would, it would impact, you know, what people thought of my scholarly work as well. So, so I think you have to, it's, it's challenging. You have to just trust everyone who's doing the editing to, to give you advice. Um, it actually took me a surprisingly short amount of time to do it. It took me a long time to probably think about it, but because I've done so many talks and because I've done so much research, um, which has involved a lot of work over the years, the actual writing of the book didn't take very long at all. Um, I just kind of sat down and wrote it um, pretty much in one go, more more or less. Um, so I, yeah, I, and it's, that's that's not I couldn't. Of course, you can't do that unless you've got all of that foundational stuff. And and also because it wasn't an academic paper, that's quite liberating in as much as not everything has to be. Well, you're writing for a different purpose, and I had done almost all of the work already in some other format. So although I did write it really quickly. Um, I, I, I mean, it, it is true to say that I wrote it in 20 days, but wow, <laughs> but with a huge but. So, it, so 20 days, and then 20 days of sort of e of editing and all the rest of it. But 20 years of preparation. Yes, that's the important bit, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, I, 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 when people ask me, I, I would say that truthfully, it took me 20 days to get that first draft out, but, but I couldn't have done it if I hadn't have got 20 years of experience behind me, and that's really crucial. So, I'm, I'm really enjoying the book, and I know it's been, um, I've seen some of the really positive reviews on Amazon, but how was the reception when you first released it? Pretty good, I think. I mean, I, I, um, I don't know which version you've got, but but when it when it came out, um, I remember feeling sort of slightly disappointed that it was in this. I think they call it a trade paperback size, so it's slightly bigger than all of the other lovely sort of penguins and kind of popular science size books. So really, the only thing that I was thinking about was I hope it gets, I hope it sells enough to get into mass market paperback size. And actually, one of the nice things that happened during lockdown was a box arrived in June with with. I know 10, 10 copies of the new mass market size because it had sold enough to get to that you know the size that now sits on the shelf properly um so I thought well um I didn't know if it would sell enough to get to that so it has so that that's job done for me fantastic congratulations <laughs> Um, so within the book, what I found a pleasant surprise was the references to friends. How yeah. come, are you a friends fan? How come you chose to, you know, analyse their, their uh, script? Yeah, um, I certainly was a huge friends fan when it came out. I know that um, some of it hasn't aged well. Um, but but I think the reason that I use some of the clips from friends dialogue is because I used to use some of those clips to teach conversation analysis because um, some of the dialogue is just really great for showing the basic workings of interaction. Um, so, for example, one of the clips is it comes from the very first episode for those of you um, who, who watch friends um, in which um, two of the characters are inviting another character to come over that night. Um, to, to help them put together some furniture and um, the, 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 the person being invited, Rachel, um, says, oh, I'd, I'd really like to, but I'm going to just stay here. I'm really tired and so on. And 
what's interesting is there's no audience laughter at this point, but then they issue the same invitation to one of the other characters, Phoebe. So, you know, Phoebe, do you want to come over? And she says, oh, I'd really love to, but I don't want to. And then the audience laughs. So there are lots of things like this where the sort of the, the, the sort of normative structure of what is expected is breached by the script writers. And that's what generates whether it's real or laughter track. But I was kind of interested in the laughter track as kind of evidence of what you should be finding funny. And Friends is full of that. It's not that it's full of set piece jokes, you know, one liners. It's a lot of the humour is built off breaking what you might expect to happen at any given moment. So, um, so yeah, that, that's what I like about it. And um, Phoebe is a, is a great character for breaking the, the norms of interaction. So there's, a, there's another great scene where um, one of the characters says, guess what? And she says, oh, I love these games. <laughs> you know, you, it, whereas in fact, you're, you're meant to respond to guess what, what, and give someone the go ahead to, to tell their story. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's really good for, for that. And, and it very quickly shows people that they really do understand that talk has got a structure to it when you think about it. So we just had a little break refilled our teas we're going to get back into the second part of the questions um so i was thinking during the break do you find it hard to switch off from work mode so say you've just gone to get a cup of tea have you just sat thinking about our interaction is it is it hard to disconnect <laughs> um I, I think it it is i mean so so people will often ask me you know am i am i currently being analyzed and and um I used to say, or, or I almost always would say, no, 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 of course not. Um, but actually I am sometimes, especially if I'm not a participant, it's quite hard to sort of participate and do the, the level of analysis that um, conversation analysis involves when you're actually in, in the encounter. Um, but yeah, I, I think if I'm looking at other people's encounters, then it's hard not to notice something if suddenly, if, if they do something that's suddenly part of a phenomenon that I'm interested in right now, then I might, noticed that in particular um so yeah i i i my, my reassuring would be no 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 of course i'm not but, but sometimes i am <laughs> with that caveat yeah i bet you're great to go people watching with when you just start watching people go by you're like oh <laughs> they talk like this <laughs> some of my favorite moments are in changing rooms when you can hear you know uh w mostly women talking to each other about what they're trying on that, that some of those moments are gold you're the best person to go shopping with them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so are you able to settle kind of one of those age old debates about who's better at communicating men or women? Women. Yes. <laughs> but, but actually, no. <laughs> so so uh, it's a great question because it's one of the most common ones that people ask it, uh, and versions of it, which are, you know, do, do women and men talk differently? Mm. Uh, and actually some of the things that I did in my PhD was handled this question or, or come to a way of thinking about this particular question. Um, so when I first started um, my PhD, I was looking at um, small, small groups of students interacting around tasks in, you know, in, in seminars and tutorials. Um, and at the time, the literature, part of the literature that I was um, contextualizing my research in was sociolinguistic research in classrooms. Basically, the argument goes something like talk and interaction and participation is really important for learning, kind of a collaborative learning idea. But boys dominate the classroom, boys dominate that and girls don't get their turns. So that was my that was that was my starting point for my PhD. And I was going to look at well, what happens in universities once you get past the classroom of school, school and into universities. And I felt very much like I could write that PhD. I felt like I could find and cherry pick bits of my data to show how, uh, you know, men students might dominate or interrupt or talk differently to the women students. But I also at the same time became really uncomfortable with the idea that what I might do is is have to cherry pick that. Or, or at least have that as my very clear lens and go looking to confirm my own hypothesis that this was happening. And so in, at the time in the 90s, there was a, a lot of um, commentary around stereotypes, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and the problems of reproducing those stereotypes. And, and of course, the thing is, the thing about stereotypes is that a lot of the time they're, they, they pass out of the realm of, of any kind of evidence and they just become what we all know about talk. Um, 
so my solution to this problem which was you know presented to me really on, on a plate by my external supervisor Derek Edwards who who introduced me to um, some of the foundational working conversation analysis was don't solve this problem yourself see if people in interaction orient to and and, and deal with the issues of gender so I had this one clip, which was a bit of a turning point in my whole PhD and the way I thought about this, in which um, three men students and one woman were, were doing a task. And at one point, um, one of them says, oh, so, oh, hang on a minute, um, someone's got to write down what we're saying, who's scribing? And, and via interactional means, including one of the um, boys saying, well, secretary, female, the girl becomes the person who makes the notes. And so what's great about that is it's got nothing to do with how people talk, but it's got everything to do with how gender is a live concern that might have consequences in an interaction for the people to either resist it or, you know, accept it or do, what does she do? Does she challenge it? So all of these things have to be worked out in the moment. And so my PhD became about that. How do people make relevant things like gender and deal with it? And then how do you how do you show that that can also be systematic, not just a one off case? So I spent probably, you know, alongside other things about 10 years needling away at that issue of how do you collect the data? How do you show that this is something that happens systematically? Um, and none of it relies on saying men talk this way and women talk that way, which I really wanted to get away from um, whilst being a committed feminist and, and sort of be, you know, maybe believing that, so, uh, you know, not believing in the interactional style thing, styles thing, but but certainly knowing that you know the world is not equal in that sense but, but trying to solve it in a different way that doesn't that in fact gives you much stronger evidence than well i i say that women and men talk differently and then sort of picking data that confirms it i think there's a, a lot of problems in in that area of work um simply because people believe it um and and, and at least from a conversation analytic point of view when you look at you know if you look at something like how do people make appointments at the doctors? You don't see any differences according to whether they're a man or a woman calling. You see differences due to how important is it that they have an appointment today and what's the situation and all those kinds of things, but not whether it's a man or a woman. I think that's really interesting. And I think you made a good point about responsible science, not cherry picking your data to fit. You know, even though it would make an interesting read, it's not necessarily yeah. accurate. Yeah. Um, so what would you say um, the most exciting thing is about being a conversation analysis? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, mean, I think exciting is an interesting word. I mean, I, for me, if it is really exciting to, to, to start a new project and think about a new aspect of um, the world that I'm going to be able to look at, whether that be, you know, people phoning the vet or buying windows or in a, in a moment of crisis and you know there is a, there is that excitement of what will these data be able to answer you know what what will they provide the answers to and so on um but you know i'm also i'm not going to lie it's, it's also really an, an amazingly exciting thing to be able to stand on the stage um where the audience is not an academic audience at all um and then talk to them about how conversation works um that's quite a thrill i'm not going to lie <laughs> And um, what would you say um, are the not so glamorous parts? Um, I, I love that question because, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody would necessarily associate academia with glamour. Um, so, and, and, but, but, but I think what, one of the things that's been quite interesting in terms of doing some of these big events, um, like Latitude or other things, is that you, you actually do get to see behind the scenes of how those things work. So I can remember I got a backstage pass, for example, to Latitude um, and I've had, um, you know, backstage passes to green rooms and speakers areas and so on. And I suppose the thing that, I mean, of course, who am I? I'm just this, you know, category Z <laughs> kind of person. But nevertheless, it was kind of funny to see how utterly unglamorous some of those backstage areas are, whatever you expect. I have never been in one where you suddenly think, wow, um, this is really special. Um, but But you do have what's interesting is how different the atmosphere can be in those backstage areas where you know basically a tub of swizzles makes you feel really special and and, and you're sort of talking to the next person who's going to go on the stage you might be very famous um so yeah sort of weirdly not glamorous but exciting at the same time we've got, we've obviously mentioned the tapler story earlier is that the weirdest thing that's happened as part of your career or is there anything else like really weird requests that you've had um, 
after the TED talk, I have had some very weird things happen. So I think probably um, the weirdest thing is that complete strangers get in touch, um, sometimes in a way that really tugs at the heartstrings and you sort of want to help people sometimes where you sort of immediately want to burn your computer because people send <laughs> horrible stuff as well so so yeah I think the, the weird thing that the very unexpected thing and the negative side of of doing some of your science in public is that you know some of the public aren't very nice and that's another thing that's kind of weird to get used to as well mm. So talking of science in public and that kind of public sphere of talking about your work, you've done a lot of media work, um, as we, the PR team, know. Um, so you've done a lot of BBC Radio 4. Is that something you expected to be doing as an academic, appearing on the radio? Because I don't know if many early career researchers would think that they need to be able to talk to journalists. Um, my first ever experience was incredibly negative. Um, but, but but it's sort of maybe a bit funny as well, or at least in the end, it turned out to be funny. So when I was um, got my first lecturing job, I was doing some work with a colleague um, on, on, on bizarrely that the interview between Martin Bashir and Princess Diana after she'd sort of split up from Charles. And I was using that interview that was very famous at the time to just teach bits of basic discourse analysis and relate, you know, not, not conversation analysis particularly, but just how language works and so on. And we'd written a couple of papers on the, on the basis of this stuff that we were mostly developing for teaching. And so when she died, a journalist um, phoned me up and said that she was from the Times Higher Educational Supplement. And I was very naive and 25, wasn't mm. it? And, uh, <laughs> And I was thinking, well, it's times higher. This is, you know, this isn't the sun phoning me up. And so I had this interview and, and I had this nagging sense all the way through that this was going to end badly for me. Um, and, and I was right. <laughs> I sort of trusted by my instincts because basically she said to me at one point, um, you know, and how did you feel when, when Diana died? And I, and, and I thought, well, I, I was thinking I'm not going to get sucked into how I felt because I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm, you know, I don't have a feeling about that and in particular. And I said <laughs> something like, well, actually, I thought, oh, bugger, I'm going to have to postpone submitting the next article. And as the words came out, I thought that was a mistake. <laughs> and I said something like, oh, but, but you're not going to you're not going to say that, are you? Because um, <laughs> and then and then I spent the next three weeks really dreading the publication of the Times Higher. And when it when it came out, this art, this article, the whole thing wasn't about scholarship and how people understand the royal family or anything like that it was basically academics picking over the bones of diana to further their career which really was not what i was doing at all and i remember just looking at this piece and feeling really like oh my god i'm never speaking to a journalist again and i remember writing to the times higher she told me that she wasn't actually employed by them she was a freelancer so she'd misrepresented her her credentials yeah. so i basically spent a lot of time worrying about that and then about i don't know five or six years later this woman got in touch and over over email and asked and, and obviously she'd been completely naive to all of my angst and and said um, I, oh you were so helpful with that piece about Diana and now I'm writing about this other piece and what's your opinion blah 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 so I just thought right <laughs> and, and I basically sort of entrapped her in, in an email exchange about the ethics and and uh, of of um journalists etiquette and all the rest of it and and at the end of this email exchange I said something like thank you very much for all of these replies I'm I'm, I'm currently analyzing interactions between academics and journalists and um and um, and so you'll you, you know you're going to see yourself in print shortly anyway she she was like what you can't do that you know never told me this and and I wrote back and said I'm not actually doing that but but you know never darken my door again and I, thought, I sort of felt like I'd had this little tiny minor triumph but what it in fact did was made me really reluctant to speak to the media for quite a long time because I thought oh this is just too scary um and then eventually you you I don't know I don't know really what happened you just feel a bit more confident or you think much more carefully about the context in which things might be taken out of context and then just say yes or no accordingly and that's what I've learned to, to be really cautious about what I actually say I'll I'll do. Yeah it's it's one of those things I think there's bad journalists that give journalism as a whole a bad name I was a journalist before this role so I you know ringing people up hi I'm a journalist can I talk to you oh you're going to twist my words and that's unfortunately the case isn't it you get one bad one and then everybody gets tired with that brush but I think 
as I'm sure you found out, there's, like I say to our academics, there's so many benefits working with the media and getting your, you know, your work out there in the public. Yeah. Um, how was it? Um, so I've also interviewed Michael Rosen, who's the, interviewed you. Yeah. So how was it going on his show? Oh, it was wonderful. Yeah. He's great, it, isn't he? Yeah, it was really, really lovely. Um, it was actually in January this year. So it was, I guess, not that long before he, you know, uh, uh, I think everyone will probably know from Twitter, um, became very ill with coronavirus um so yeah I, um it's sort of taken on a bit of a poignant edge for me as well because of because of all of the things that have happened this year but it was amazing he was wonderful the conversation was fantastic um and i'm i'm really proud of that interview um and i'm glad it's there for people to go and listen to and, and learn a little bit more about conversation analysis you've achieved a lot the tedx talk a book so much that i think early year researchers would you know, dream to be able to do. What is your, I don't mean like end goal, but what is your dream now? What is there a particular goal you have in mind that you'd like to achieve? Um, I think um, this might sound a bit naff, but it's true. And I think I learned it from my PhD supervisor, Eunice Fisher, who was just the most brilliant, wonderful, warm, um, incisive and I think really crucially ego-free academic um, and, and also my dad who was a woodwork teacher um, for half of his career and his ambition was to um, have a student a pupil who was better at woodwork than him um, and my supervisor um, you know on paper you know she, she was a late she, she was a mature student and, and sort of entered academia quite late in her own career um, and as I said earlier, you know, I was her one and only PhD student just before she retired. Um, we still see each other a lot. She's 80 plus now, but we we just became immediately bonded over some kind of approach to life, which I think is really important. So I think for me, what I want is to, uh, if possible, uh, and, and I hope I've managed to do this at least half of the time, if not more, you know, create, create um, a, a, an environment in which my own PhD students can flourish and be amazing and I think have you know having PhD students who and, and other and others who just become um, amazing and you've had a little part in kind of you know they're in the boat rowing away and you're just kind of nudging them a bit and and kind of hoping that you help them move forward and um, I think I'm I'm super proud of my PhD students in particular because I've had some absolutely amazing ones and they're all you know doing great things so I think that's it really because mm -hmm. in the end um, if you can't work with people and somehow support people who end up doing far better than you do then nothing ever moves forward so that's what we need to, to keep the field moving forward and new insights and all the rest of it so yeah that, that's that's it really that's that's the metric of success I think so we've spoken about work um, and kind of projects and stuff like that. Um, so what does a conversation analysis do in their spare time for fun? Have you got any kind of quirky hobbies that people wouldn't expect? <laughs> <laughs> um, I drink a lot of tea um, and I've become really into, into tea in a, in a way that maybe some people are into coffee, you know, um, mm. or, or, or just something where you, 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 you start to get some like obsessively interested in what it is that you're, that you're drinking in that sense. But no, I, I, I'm a, I'm a pretty slow runner. Um, I've run for a long time. I mean, it's funny being at Loughborough actually. And I remember when I first moved here running somewhere and in the opposite direction was coming, um, and her name immediately escapes me, Paula, um, Bradford. Well, the right cliff, that's the one. <laughs> and she was, yeah, I was running up to the outwards and she was coming in the other direction, you know, looking amazing and um, like, you know, kind of sculpted. And I was sort of going at, you know, what, a tenth of her pace in the other direction and thinking, well, you know, I'm at Loughborough and I'm never going to be the world's best runner, but but I like running and I, and I especially just like being outside and I've really appreciated walking in and just the amazing countryside um i love all that um i read loads so obviously i, I said earlier that um i sort of thought i might be a bookshop or publishing kind of person so i'm um what you what you can't see in in here um I, I could i could i could show you with my webcam um but my, maybe that messes up the recording of is our, i'm sitting surrounded by a lot of books um so yeah um and most recently i've 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 got into trying to 
actually create um, Scandinavian kinds of baking because I really miss um, going, going, you know, I normally I would, I would have been to Norway and Sweden several mm. times a year for various, you know, purposes. And so I'm trying to recreate fika, which is the Swedish tea break thing, um, and make cardamom buns. So I've met, I've had four goes now and I'm just sort of gradually perfecting these um, cardamom buns. So that sounds, I'm currently obsessed by that as well. <laughs> I love that. And I bet your family's loving it as well. <laughs> All these fantastic foods. Um, so we've kind of, going back onto the research side of things, what kind of exciting projects have you got going on at the moment? What's, what's coming up? Um, at the moment, I'm hopefully coming towards the end, at least nothing ever really comes to the end because, it, you know, you can, you can always keep reanalyzing all of the data that you um, ever collect as a conversation on this, but at least formally, um, I'm coming to the resolution of a project which is with colleagues at Leeds University and um, Leeds University Hospital, which is looking at um, midwives talking with pregnant women about um, the first set of tests um that they might have antenatally um and, and how best to get consent for those tests or, or deal with the whole issue of consenting to the antenatal testing so there's that project um i'm also um just starting at work um which is actually being led by an, an old phd student of mine emma richardson who's now at aston and we're just starting to work with um two police forces on 999 domestic violence calls and the, the purpose of the project is to look at what's happening now during the pandemic because we know you know there's been lots of reports over the over the past few months about increased rates of domestic mm -hmm. violence um, and what what we start what what we realized by talking with the police is that in fact um, reports to the police weren't going up but reports to um, things like rape crisis or other charities or crime stoppers they were really amplified so our, our what we're going to do is is look at 999 calls now um, and then what they look like this time last year to just to try and get a sense for in, in the first instance of what do they look like um, so that we can try to in the end you know the goal is to try and figure out how these interactions can be optimized and and, and most effective in terms of um, supporting and protecting victims um, mm. so that project and then the third thing that I'm, um, well, the, there's always bits and pieces, but the, the other thing that I'm quite excited about is um, I've become um, a, a sort of conversational consultant to a company called Deployed, who are a startup who uh, in March won a massive, vast, multi-million grant from Microsoft Venture Fund, um, the female founders competition. Um, so Deployed are a, are a, are a, a a tech startup who have had tremendous success um, in winning this this competition this global competition from Microsoft and I've, I've been talking to them for a while ever since I came back from Barcelona working with Typeform and so I'm going to work with them a little bit on how to again um, well for me translate conversation analytic science into things that make for a really good online question based filling in form based experience in 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 their area of that tech world so that leads quite nicely onto my next question which is what do you think the hot, hot topics will be for future conversation analysis yeah do you think it will be because i know there's quite a few companies that are replacing callers with an ai mm -hmm. kind of automated voice that does sound realistic which is quite scary i know there's a hairdressing one that's kind of circulated online um do you think that's kind of the direction it'll be moving in. Do you do you think we will kind of you know like the mediators? Do you think there'll one day be AI mediators on the phone? <laughs> <laughs> I think I hope I hope not actually. Um, it's interesting the hairdressing example that you mentioned because I think that probably comes from um, Google Duplex, which was yes. used to a big fanfare last year, I think. Um, and my colleague at, at Loughborough, Saul Albert. Um, and I and some of the colleagues have been looking at the very, very limited amount of data that has been released that you can analyze and comparing it to how how people might um, book a hair book a hairdresser's appointment when when you're not talking to an AI on the other end. And you're right, the voice you know you can't really tell um, unless you know um, because of the because of the way 
it's been recorded, whatever voice they've used. But of course, um, no one picks up the phone at the hairdressers and expects to be talking to an AI. So, so at least part of the way that works is because we all compensate all the time as human beings when we're interacting. We 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 don't start from the from the from the assumption that you're talking to a a robot or whatever that might mean. And I think that so that so but I think that's a really interesting area, simply because we also did some research looking at mystery shoppers making service inquiries and compared what a mystery shopper whose job it is to kind of evaluate how good the experience is when you call a company compare what they do to somebody who's really really phoning if you like for the for the act and actually wanting the service um partly because and what we basically showed was that um the mystery shopper doesn't ask for the same things and they don't ask for the same they don't ask for things in the same way and they basically don't give the person whose job it is, is to provide service the same tasks to kind of overcome and fulfill so in terms of first of all the methodology of mystery shopping it's ne no one's ever really looked at what do mystery shoppers do do they actually generate an equivalent set of conditions such that you could really say something robust about the experience that the provider is giving and i think the answer to that is basically no they're not um, because mystery shoppers aren't doing the same things as the genuine or the, the sort of real customers or so on um, but what that tells us as well is that the, the mystery shoppers are a really good example of what we all think happened in encounters and and quite a lot of what we think and how we think communication works feeds into simulations or ai or role play and so you end up with this weird kind of how we think interaction works being the foundation for how a lot of other things are built um, so that's if that's a big problem from from our point of view and i think that's one of the things that we might start to address more in, in a more systematic way over the coming years. Okay. Um, I like that, that conversation analysis could be the key to realistic AI robots, the, the crossover of those sciences, I think it's really cool. Yeah. Um, so other than looking at tech, um, where else do you think are kind of key areas for students studying in this area at the moment what do you think is kind of the branches that are going to be important over the next decade or so well i think uh, an obvious one is is tell you know tele telemedicine tele sales tele, tele you know remote interaction that we're of the type that we're having now um because obviously um a lot of life has moved online um and i think one of the one of the things um i decided to write about um just a sort of very brief thing um that i put out um, about online interaction versus in-person interaction and you know a lot there's a lot of commentary about how they're different and the quality of them and all the rest of it and, and I basically wanted to say just before we start talking about the relative qualities of of in-person versus um, this we're still face to face right <laughs> so we're remote we are face to face so I, I like to prefer I prefer to say in person for you know the, the sort of in the same room um modality but um I think if you're a good communicator you're probably a good communicator everywhere um so just because you're in person doesn't guarantee quality of any kind uh, and you only have to think about any argument you ever had with someone in person or any Ex encounter with a GP or a sales encounter or you know just just pretty, or let you know look, pretty much every encounter that you might have ever had in person doesn't mean it's going to be good you know, you've probably had some terrible experiences in person and probably some great experiences online so I think we need to sort of stop making assumptions about relative quality um, and and don't let some of those myths and stereotypes be the foundation for building for example the idea that when you're talking remotely there's no body language um, if you start from the position that communication is 93 percent body language which we hopefully skewered mm -hmm. before then you, you can kind of see how people will start to see that this kind of encounter is really problematic because you don't have access to people's bodies um, but that's not it's not really true um, and it, and and the the, the foundation will position isn't correct either um, and one of my favorite examples actually of very early in lockdown is is having a conversation with my aunt and my dad um, on on a zoom and my dad was kind of he, he, he I think he was a bit grumpy um, so he was kind of like doing this and anyway and so me and my aunt went 
and we did it down the down the camera to each other because we knew we could because we knew he was kind of like looking over here <laughs> so you can do actually very subtle things um down a zoom um much more than we might stereotypically imagine so i think i think that all of that area is going to be quite important in the coming coming months and years interesting um so do you have any advice or words of wisdom for you know students very early on in their academic journey is there anything you wish you could have been told at 18 years old that would have helped um i think as i probably maybe said earlier follow your nose especially if you've got a really good sense of smell um don't worry about what others think if you possibly can although that is incredibly hard maybe harder now than it ever was but you know somehow try not to worry about what other people say or think if you if you really can i would have strongly encouraged my my younger self to do that and my younger self would have just laughed and said don't be ridiculous um i think say yes you know i've said yes to a lot of things that i didn't really know where it was going to lead and sometimes they've been scary um you know made me anxious that I've, I've said yes to doing something and i've got to do it and i'm, and I'm a bit and it's a bit nerve-wracking like the ted talk to be honest that was terrifying um and uh maybe don't you know i would have <laughs> don't straighten your hair <laughs> i spent such a lot of time wasted you know just trying to get my hair to go straight <laughs> embrace the fairly girl method <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, this is a question from our producer dame which i think is a really good question um he said he thinks a lot of people listening to this podcast will be looking to start a career do you have any kind of good interview techniques oh, yeah. like, from your studies um i think having interviewed lots of lots of people over my career i've been on lots of interview panels for you know new 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 colleagues at loughborough um i think it's it might sound like a cliche but really really listen to the question and answer it um try to be concise and precise um a lot of you know a lot of times people are obviously nervous and they're not listening properly to what the question really wants um and so you know go off at a bit of a tangent so i think listening to the re really answering the question is important um i've also noticed over the years that if you ask um you know what do you do especially if you're if you're talking to you know a potential new academic and you want them to explain their work and why why they're doing something that's important and ask them to do that in just you know language that anyone should be able to understand a, a lot of people can't do that very well you know they might start the first five words are anyone can understand and then it quickly sort of goes into you know um the, whatever the language is of the particular discipline and then that you know you, you may or may not be lost so i think being able to explain what you do in really in in plain english is probably quite important as well and, and being able to actually engage people that with integrity but without necessarily worrying about having all of that um what would the word be you know impressed by clarity rather than jargon i think i would say yes. um i also think interviewers have some responsibility as well um because i think um interviewers can ask terrible questions so i think interviewers are, are partly responsible for you know <laughs> or at least at least partly responsible for shaping the interview experience and maybe we don't focus enough on some of the daft things that people get asked in interviews <laughs> Hopefully I've not asked any of those daft things. <laughs> no, not you. But, but you know, I've, got, I, I've definitely been asked daft questions in interviews where you think, well, I could answer that question, but but it's not really going to tell you anything about me as a potential colleague. Um, um, and one final question for you. So as I touched on kind of with the entirety of this podcast series, I want this series to be for people that are considering a career in science, but they don't know how broad science actually is so it's not just white lab coats as we explained um so why should somebody consider a career in social sciences yeah that's a great question to to end on um i think it's because social sciences are the place where you're going to be able to um learn about um and understand and shape everything we know about what people do and why they do it why they don't do it how people change or don't change or resist change or comply with things or don't um what their experiences are all of those things are you're going to learn within the social sciences fantastic thank you so much for joining us and um, before we head off is there anything you'd like to plug or mention 
Uh, no, I think I would just recommend at some point, if you're still drinking tea bags, you, you should really try to experience uh, fresh tea leaves. Put the straighteners down as well. <laughs> and put your straighteners oh, down. Yeah, I'm going to plug it for you. Get the book, guys. I'm absolutely <laughs> loving the book. Um, it's got my very nerdy Dungeons and Dragons bookmark in it, but really enjoying it. I think it's a great read. So I'll plug that for you. <laughs> Thank you all for listening or watching the second episode of Couple with a Scientist. We hope you found it interesting and will join us again. Do leave a comment and get in touch. We'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts on who you'd like to see on the show. And make sure you don't miss a show by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other mainstream podcast platforms. You can also subscribe to the Love for University YouTube channel if you prefer to watch the show. See you in the next episode when we'll be back for more hot tea and even hotter stories to help you on your way to becoming a scientist. 